Hello everyone, my name is Mike Snow and I'm going to be talking about episode 15 of Twin Peaks The Return. Uh, this was another excellent episode, uh, as even, even with the Dougie stuff, I'll get to that in a second, because that was actually a little bit more interesting than usual. Uh, we start out with Ed and Nadine, who in the original series had, to put it mildly, a tumultuous relationship. And Nadine comes to Ed with one of her gold Dr. Jacoby shit shovel and shovels in hand and says, I am sorry for, you know, treating you so badly and abusing you essentially for all of these years and just being nasty and horrible and, you know, not letting you go to the woman that you absolutely love. And Ed suggests that she's going to regret this later. And, you know, there's an implication that maybe she's been down this road before and said these things. But Ed is just so happy and so overjoyed about all this that he just takes Nadine at face value. And I, I hope that she stays with this. And I hope that Nadine stays as she has been saying that, you know, she's going to reject her emotional manipulation over all of these years, manipulating her mental health, threatening or actually attempting suicide at times, and just let Ed go with Norma. You know, I, I think this is 25 years a little bit too late, but, you know, better late than never. And then we get a wonderful scene where we see Norma rejecting the corporatization of her double R diner franchise and just owning one diner and selling off the rest and sending them away. And we get, you know, they, they kind of tease us a little bit by making it seem when Ed goes to see Norma and the double R that, oh, maybe, you know, she's going to go with this other guy and they're seeing each other. But Norma eventually comes around to Ed and there's a wonderful passionate kiss there with this uh, sort of R&B kind of music playing in the background, or sort of soul music rather playing in the background. And, and it's kind of a beautiful little scene and I love to see these guys together. And I'm so happy that they're actually together after all this time. I think it kind of sucks. They sort of teased us that this wasn't going to happen in the last episode, but you know, as long as it happens, I'm fine with it. I love to see these two together. They're a cornerstone of the show, just as much as the double R is a cornerstone of Twin Peaks, the town. Now, next we get what is unquestionably, I think, the best and most interesting part of all of these episodes, whether the original series or now, we get into the supernatural element of the show. When we see Evil Cooper pull up to the convenience store that was mentioned so many years ago by Bob and Mike, or Mike rather mentioned that they said we lived in, I think you call it convenience store. And it looks like a convenience store from the 40s or 50s that's long since been disused. And apparently it's some sort of conduit into the weird world of the lodges. And uh, Evil Cooper goes in there and meets Philip Jeffries. Um, unfortunately, uh, David Bowie uh, either was not asked to be in the series or died before the series uh, could, could film his scenes. And we get to see Evil Cooper interacting with what we hear is Philip Jeffries, the man who had such a pivotal scene in uh, Firewalk with me, this strange agent that we learn apparently was Gordon Cole's partner and started the Blue Rose cases and all of this investigation into these creatures way back in the 1970s. And he is apparently transmogrified, much as the man from another place is transformed into some sort of unrecognizable form while in the lodges, he looks like a boiling pot of coffee, maybe? Maybe maybe that's not right, I don't know. It, it looks so weird, I, I can't quite put my finger on it. But he has all this steam coming out of him. There's a weird, a weird association in Lynch's work with evil with industry. Like somehow industrialization is an evil process, C considering all the environmentalist uh, aspects of Twin Peaks, I guess that's not surprising. But he's this bizarre creature that's able to speak to him. And he's voiced not by David Bowie, of course, because he's passed away, but by a voice actor imitating him. And because David Bowie was doing this weird southern accent at the time, it's barely distinguishable as being someone different. And we see that apparently what we learned many episodes ago, I think in the first episode, first or second, that Dale, that Evil Cooper, excuse me, was in contact with Philip Jeffries was not the case and that Philip Jeffries actually hadn't uh, done any of these things, hadn't called Dale and tried to speak to him, and maybe and hadn't sent Ray to, uh, to kill Evil Coop, and that maybe it was somebody else. I think in the last episode, or was it two episodes ago, it was implied that the one-armed man, uh, Mike, 
was the person that uh, had been arranging for Cooper to be murdered so that Coop could get back out here, but uh, it's still a little unclear what's been going on. We also get mention of the mysterious Judy. Philip Jeffrey mentions a woman named Judy, specifically to say, we're not going to talk about her, we're going to leave her out of it. And we never know who Judy is, and it looks like they're finally going to be answering this bizarre quarter-century-long mystery in Twin Peaks of who the heck is Judy. I don't have any speculation as to who that is, because Philip Jeffries mentions that Judy may be someone that, Co that Evil Cooper has met before. Presumably he means only Evil Cooper. But I don't know who that could be. I can't remember anyone named Judy. Who has Evil Coop interacted with? That's a woman that we know. Unless it's someone that we haven't seen yet, I can't think of who this Judy could be. I mean, it couldn't possibly be Diane, could it? That can't be related to Judy, like the creature that's parasitizing Diane, maybe? If, if that's what's happening, Diane, I have no idea about that, but maybe Diane was good. But like Sarah Palmer, something is inside of her, taking control of her. If that's indeed the situation going on to Sarah Palmer, because of course we don't get, we, you know, it, it's every other episode we get a continuation of the previous story. So it, I guess we're going to get a continuation of that the next episode. So I, we don't really know what's going on. But that was a fascinating sequence with... And I love it. I love the absurdity. I love the surrealist quality of it. I, I that That's why I love David Lynch. It's just completely beyond can, although not beyond speculation, thankfully. So it's still always there for people to theorize about. But I don't know what Agent, uh, what Agent Jeffries is even doing in there, or if that really is him or some sort of evil version of him that's in the lodge transmogrified into some sort of weird creature. Um, I, I, I have no idea why he would necessarily want... Agent Co uh, Evil Cooper to come back to the lodge or be killed because it's a little unclear what Agent Jeffries even wants anymore these days. He seems sort of insane, but still sort of not even sort of a good person. But we see him in Firewalk with me, but it's, it's very hard to tell. I, I don't really know what was going on. Uh, but the scene ends with Evil Cooper interacting with Richard Horn, and Richard Horn confirms what we all knew for a while now that Audrey is his mother. Richard Horn and Evil Cooper get together finally, and you know, we knew this was going to happen. A lot of people speculated about this, and you know, because Richard saw Evil Cooper there, he looked right at him and recognized him, because apparently he saw him as a picture on the wall of his mother Audrey. So, you know, they obviously know one another, and they get into a car and drive off together, but we're going to have to wait at least until the next episode or maybe a couple of episodes to see that continued and see what's going on. But I presume that Richard is going to start working with his evil, I guess, father. That's, again, that's speculation at this point, but a lot of people have been suggesting that really, almost certainly, I mean, that has to be his father, right? Evil Cooper has to be Richard Horn's dad at, at this point. I mean, it, it seems almost certain. But uh, I don't know what they're going to get up to or if he's going to be his lackey or be used by him or maybe Richard's going to try to betray him or something because he has a gun pointed at him at the beginning suggesting that Evil Cooper did something horrifying to Audrey. But having the photograph of Agent Cooper kind of you know, suggests that Audrey still had some lingering feelings for him afterwards. Speaking of Audrey, we get another little moment with Audrey Horn in whatever weird situation she's in, is she in the real world? Are there multiple worlds? Is she just still in a coma? I guess not, because if she had a picture of him on the mantelpiece at their home that she shared with her son Richard, that means she was out of the coma at some point. Maybe she's just insane, or there's something deeply wrong with her, or she's trapped in some sort of weird alternate world, like the lodges or something like that. She is once again, for like the fourth or fifth episode, trying to leave her home and go to the roadhouse, but she can't quite get outside. She doesn't want to leave. She wants to stay and she wants to go. And her husband is there and she just is, you know, screaming this nonsense at him and she's going kind of crazy and says how much she fucking hates him and that, she, that he's not really who he says he is and that she's a different person and, and that they're both different people than she thinks. Uh, so what I imagine is going on, what I, my personal belief at this point is that she's imagining most of this, and that this person is some sort of sinister force, perhaps from the Lodge, and maybe not a real person. I, I mean, I'm, maybe that's crazy, and he is, and I'm just, you know, off in fantasy land myself, but I'm not really certain about that. Also, uh, her husband says something very peculiar. He says, uh, you know, we're standing here at this threshold, and that... You know, he very pointedly says the fairly unusual word, threshold. And 
you know, that's kind of an unusual word to say right next to your door, like a very formal designation of what that is. And it instantly made me think of the dweller on the threshold, that weird statement for a double or a doppelganger that, uh, you know, had such an important effect on the end of the second season that Hawk mentions. You know, that makes me think that there's something sinister and otherworldly going on here that he mentioned the word threshold. That's very, very strange. So, but but we're you know we're not going to know what's going to happen at least until the next episode if you know Audrey's just dreaming all of this or if she you know what does she mean that she's not her and he's not him you know you, you know that makes it makes me think that this is all a dream of some kind that they or someone is having that they are inhabiting you know the last episode was we are the dreamer I, 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 maybe maybe she's being dreamt about or she's in somebody's dream and we don't really know what's going on but uh, it's fascinating and and really good and. You know, I think it puts puts paid to those those statements there that people had when they first saw Audrey that that really wasn't a very good scene. I think it really paid off later on, that whole sequence with Audrey. You know, I was intrigued by what was happening more so than I was sort of unhappy about it. But I think it's going to lead somewhere really good and really interesting and part of the, the lore of the whole series. We also get a really, really well-acted and interesting sequence with Gersten Hayward, Alicia Witt, uh, and uh, Stephen, uh, Amanda Seyfried's husband, Rebecca's husband in this one. And he does a really good job. I mean, this actor is very good, and Alicia Witt is excellent as well. They do a fantastic job as they sit in the woods, sort of hugging one another, blasted out of their minds and some sort of horrible drug. And I could barely understand what he was saying. I'm going to have to go back and watch it with the subtitles on and see if I can catch more of what he was saying. But he seemed suicidal and drug crazed and didn't know what was happening and I hope he didn't try to hurt uh, Amanda Seyfried because that I mean maybe I got the wrong impression there but it kind of seemed like he was saying he might have hurt her uh, I, I mean I, it's I hope not but he is so distraught and so screwed up on these drugs that he actually commits I mean I we think he commits suicide he we hear a gunshot off screen and it's kind of implied that maybe he shot himself, but we don't really know what happened. So we're going to have to wait until the next episode to see that. But it's just amazingly well acted as these two. Uh, uh, Alicia Witt, and I don't remember the actor's name who played Stephen, but he's they're, they're both amazing in this sequence. This very poignant, sad, dark, frightening sequence, very emotional moment of these two characters as they sort of like, you know, he really feels like he's clinging desperately to anything to do with life and telling her that he loved having sex with her and loved being with her and he loved fighting with her. And, he, you know, he loved all of the physical interactions he had with the world and with life and just how incredibly uh, miserable and, and horrified he is about what he's about to do. And presumably he does kill himself. Right? We're going to have to wait until what happens. You know, that, that's something that actually happened with Leo, this awful person who becomes so, he's so violent and cruel and terrible and he's doing drugs and he's hurting people. And yet we see him in a sympathetic light later on in episode, in season two. And he actually becomes sort of a, a character that's sort of miserable and pathetic. And that is really what this guy seems more than a brutal wife beater and a, a savage, a horrible drug user and cheater. He really just seems someone that's pitiable and and it's sort of miserable what's happening to him and how horrifying his life is. But it was an amazing scene. We also get a moment where James and his begloved buddy go into the bar. And he tries to talk to a woman there that clearly has named Renee, that clearly has some sort of feelings for him we saw in a previous episode. And Renee's husband freaks out and attacks him. And Glove Boy just beats both of them up and puts both of them in critical condition in the hospital. And he and James both, both get locked up in the jail. And maybe this was supposed to happen. Maybe it had to happen to get the glove guy near Nido in the jail to protect her when she needs protection. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen. But they're now in jail with Chet and the weird drunk guy with the facial disfigurement and Nido. And we don't know what's going to happen there. I assume he's going to help Nido when Evil Cooper Richard tries to come and kill or hurt them. But uh, overall, I think this was really an amazing episode. I really liked everything that was going on. And, you know, it, it, there was a, even a moment with Dougie here that I actually enjoyed because Dougie C is watching television, just seemingly randomly poking around on a, a remote control. And he's like an infant. He doesn't know what's going on. And he ends up watching a, a, a short clip from Sunset Boulevard. Which makes me think that uh, Janie E watches Turner Classic Movies, which is, you know, that's really, that's great for her. I love that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of intelligent film watched in that household. But but anyway, 
uh, he's watching Sunset Boulevard briefly, and he hears the name Gordon Cole mentioned in the famous scene where they go to meet Cecil B. DeMille, and she thinks she's going to get, you know, a big movie contract back and somehow rekindle her career, and apparently they, he actually says the name Gordon Cole. Is that where the name Gordon Cole comes from all this time? From that character briefly mentioned there? I mean, Sunset Boulevard is one of the best movies ever made, and I love it, and it's film noir, so David Lynch probably likes it, and I presume Mark Frost likes it as well, so is that where the name Gordon Cole came from? Maybe not. Maybe that was just a coincidence. I mean, it's such a minor little moment in that movie, you know, that, that they say the word Gordon Cole, but... But anyway, Dougie Coop hears Gordon Cole, the name, and he has a sudden flash of recognition. The memory banks are starting to tune up again. And he, he, he sees the electrical socket on the wall, and he actually sticks his fork in there and gets electrocuted. Is this the thing that we've been waiting for for like 15 episodes now? Or I, mean, I guess not 15 episodes, but like 12 episodes. Is this the thing we've been waiting for that Cooper will finally come back? We don't know. We just don't know what's going to happen there. And we're just going to have to wait and see the next next week. I hope against hope that he's going to come back. But it was a cute little scene there where he, he sees, you know, Kyrgyz Gordon Cole's name on Sunset Boulevard. That was uh, in the movie Sunset Boulevard. That was great. The show ends with a really weird, dark sequence where a woman is sitting at the bar in the roadhouse. It always ends at the roadhouse, or almost always does. And she's sitting down at the roadhouse, and she doesn't look too happy. And two big, tough, kind of like rough-looking men with leather jackets come by. And I thought for a second that she was going to be attacked and hurt, but thankfully she wasn't. And they come over there, and they see her, and she says, I'm waiting for a friend. And they just grab her and roughly throw her out of the seat. Now, uh, you know, she is totally unprepared for this and kind of horrified and just sort of sits there on the floor, like on all fours, just staring and sort of crawling like a baby, and then begins screaming, just screaming her head off in the middle of all this. And this, is this another commentary about like some kind of like the horrible wickedness of the world, of the world, or something like this? And you're supposed to just sort of feel that the entire universe somehow symbolically is becoming more cruel and violent, and this poor young girl is just being cast aside and rudely thrown on the floor and not cared about by these people, and no one comes to her help, no one's going to go over there. Is it trying to show that Twin Peaks is missing some spark of goodness? And maybe when Coop gets there, people are going to start acting good again? I can't believe that this is going to be real behavior in the real world. Like some woman just gets thrown onto the ground at a bar and no one in the huge crowd says, hey, you jerk, don't do that. No one helps her, no one does anything, but I mean, I guess that's possible, but Anyway, I'm really looking forward to more episodes. I'm really looking forward to seeing where this story is going. And I'm perking up more and more that they're focusing on the weird supernatural aspects of the show. Probably most poignant in this episode is that we actually get to see Margaret Lanterman call up Hawk one last time and die. And it's so horrifying and so tragic and sad because Catherine Coulson actually did die a few years ago when she was filming this. And she looks as if she is suffering from the effects of severe illness. And she actually says, you know, I'm dying. And you feel like, well, the actress is kind of saying that. That's so sad and so dark to see that. And there's this wonderful moment where Hawk announces that she's died to the whole team at the sheriff's station. It's so, it's so, oh my God, it's so emotional and affecting. It's, it's really, really sad. It's, it's really an affecting scene. It's, it's so sad. You know, they, it, there's just this, they meet in this darkened room. You know, the room very specifically is barely lit. We can hardly see anyone. The hawk is outlined in shadow. It's just so grim and unple you know, it's 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 really it really hits you right here, you know, to see this beloved character has died and it really drives it home that the actress has died too. And the end of the episode, weirdly enough, it actually says like in memory of Margaret Lanterman, not Catherine Colson, in memory of the character that she played. That's kind of weird. I mean, I, I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's, it was, it was very, very sad. And, and it was kind of interesting to see her, you know, in, in loving memory of the character, like the, you know, this beautiful character that's enriched all of our lives and is now gone forever is, you know, memorialized in this, uh, in, in this episode. It's, it's a strange moment. But anyway, please tell me in the comments what you thought of the episode. What do you think of the show so far? What are your theories about what Richard and Evil Cooper are going to get up to? And 
what, what tell me what you think Philip Jeffries was because I couldn't quite make that out what the heck the thing in there was it was it was totally lost on me and please tell me what if you've updated your theories about Audrey at all because I really want to hear that I've been hearing so many things about what could be going on there am I completely off base about it being like a wild you know like dreamscape that they're in or is she sort of lost in a weird dream somehow and this guy you know what we're seeing is not actually reality and do you think that the town of Twin Peaks is somehow representative of America and sort of the declining morality of everyone and we're sort of losing our sense of self and identity and and goodness in the world and everything is turning to evil and so forth and and that's what they're trying to show us with all of these very sad moments in bars where men are being mean to women which seems to happen repeatedly and please like this video if you liked it. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos I'm going to be making about Twin Peaks. I'm going to be re reacting to the next episode next week on the next Monday. My name is Mike Snow, and I hope you have a good day.